so commend yeah. you for that. So I want to I want to hit something else. Pretty. Uh, this is so powerful. All this stuff is so powerful. Um, but I want to also go back into the origin story just a little bit more. And that I know because I was there that your your childhood wasn't uh, ideal, right? I think that's yeah. fair to say, and that your friends mm -hmm. were always uh, supportive. That includes me, you know, growing up. Um, and that was tough, you know, uh, for sure. I know we've spoken about it, not a lot, briefly. And, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't as good a friend as I could have been so apologize about that for sure oh. yeah. yeah we were we were just young kids and we didn't know any better you know just we were just trying to get by and just you know just trying to be accepted and trying to fit in where we could you know especially being in the situation that we were in you know I mean, being the only black kids you know in in the neighborhood of of all white kids, you know, we're trying to fit in as much as we can. And so if it means giving somebody a hard time to fit in, you know, we're just trying to make life, all of us are just trying to make life a little easier for ourselves. So I understand, you know. It's tough, um, for sure. So I, so I appreciate your, your grace on that, you know, definitely. Yeah. You know, we all need that from time to time. No but, uh, you know, so I know in high school we talked about, you know, was, uh, and I didn't know, you know, we found, I found this out just a few years ago, actually. You, you went through a really dark period uh, in high school. You want to speak on that for just a few minutes? Yeah, um, it's, it's really what, what led me up to, to making, you know, just the drastic changes in my life that, that needed to be made. Uh, I, you know, didn't have a real great childhood even before I had gotten to Olathe. Uh, you know, my parents did the best that they could, and they, they took good care of me. And uh, my, my mother and father divorced when I was five. And when they split up, you know, it, it, it had a tough effect on me. And, you know, I, I grew up feeling isolated and alone, even though I had you know, four older brothers, and then eventually one younger brother. You know, so there's six boys in my in our in our house. My mom has six sons. I was the only Robinson in the house. So you know, I always just felt by myself, and I I grew up doing things by myself. You know, being by myself a lot. Uh, when I was five, uh, man, you know. I was five years old, and I was going to school. I was in first grade, and when I would wake up in the morning, there was nobody home because my my mother was a single mom, and my older brothers were all in school, you know, and their school started earlier than mine, so they had already left for school. So when I, you know, my mom was at work. We lived in Kansas City, Kansas. She worked in Lee Summit, Missouri, and so she would have to leave, you know, before sunup just to get to work on time. So when I woke up, there was nobody in the house. I would have to get up, fix my own breakfast, uh, wash myself, get my clothes, you know, get dressed, you know, dress myself, uh, check the house, make sure all the windows and doors were locked. And then I would have to call my mother at work, tell her I'm getting ready to leave for school. And then I would leave for school, walk to school by myself. After school, walk home by myself, unlock the doors, check the house, check all the closets and, and rooms, make sure nobody's broken in. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself. I was, I was a real loner you know, growing up in a house full of people. Uh, so by the time I got to Olathe and got into my adolescent years, man, you know, it was tough, you know, especially going to, moving from a, an all black neighborhood where I didn't really, even though I was there and I looked like them, I, 
I didn't really fit in with them. And now I go to an all white neighborhood where I really don't fit in with them. Got in a fight, you know, my first day of school. And uh, so it's just, you know, it was tough. It was really tough. And so by the time I got to high school, man, I was just so, I, I had this attitude of nobody cares about me, so why should I care about myself? So I got to the point to where I just started letting myself go. You know, I, I didn't keep up my hygiene the way that I should because I didn't care. I felt like nobody else does. Why should I? And, uh, you know, I, I was just miserable. I, I was just in a place, you know, just a deep depression, you know, all the time. And I finally got to the point to where I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to end it all. And I wanted to take my own life. We didn't have a gun uh, at our house. We didn't have any guns at home. And so I decided I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll do it in the car, you know, um, being on a football team, uh, and living in our neighborhood used to go to a lot of parties and stuff on Friday nights after games. And, you know, you know, we would, you know, you were there, we would go to parties in Whispering Hills and, um, it'd be like two carloads of us. And, you know, we were just, you know, doing crazy things as kids, you know, just stupid. And, you know, we sometimes, you know, you know, Richard would have a car full. I would be driving sometimes or, or Bill Jackson would be driving or Tony Adams would be driving, you know, so it always, it was so many of us, we, we couldn't all fit in the same car because it was a bunch of big football players. And uh, so it'd be two carloads of us, and it's Friday night, it's late, and we would drive down Woodland, heading from Olathe, heading out, to, you know, into Shawnee Mission to go into Whispering Hills. And we would turn the lights off and have contests to see who could keep their lights off the longest. Whoever turned the lights on first lost, you know. So <laughs> doing stupid stuff like that, man, for so long. Uh, I learned every inch of that road. I knew where every turn was. I knew all the straightaways. I knew all the hazards. And so one day uh, on a, uh, I think it was a Thursday night, Thursday evening, I asked my mom if I could borrow her car. And I went over on Woodland Road and it was before the sun had went down. It was about 6.30 in the evening. And I planned out where I tried to find a spot that would be the best spot for me to run off the road and die. Just have the car blow up or just to make sure that I wouldn't end up in the hospital. I wanted, I wanted this crash to end my life. So where can I... Where can I go? Well, what embankment can I find that will cause them the most amount of damage and the quickest death? And I found this spot where they were doing a bunch of construction out there at the time. And they had this big rock quarry dug out, you know, and there was a guardrail at the end of this curve. And I meant I, I parked the car, got out and walked over to the guardrail. And I found the spot that had the least amount of reinforcement behind it. And I marked that guardrail. And the reason why I marked it was because I said to myself, I want to do one more thing that I enjoy before I die. And this was, this was Thursday evening. And that next evening, I was scheduled to go to a dinner theater that our, our teacher, Sam Johnson, uh, had arranged to take a bunch of his students to the Waldo, to Waldo, uh, to the dinner theater at, at the Waldo. And I, re I was big into theater, you know, even though I was a football player, I, I was in every play in high school. You know, I loved the theater. 
And uh, so I said, I'm going to go to that dinner theater. And then on Saturday, I'm coming back out here. Here's the spot. I marked the spot. This is where I'm going to hit. Here's how fast I have to be going in order to get through the guardrail. Just did the math. Just planned the whole thing out. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I went to school the next day and I took my change of clothes to go to the dinner theater right after, after school. We went to the dinner theater and Mr. Johnson had this, this big 17 passenger van, uh, because he used to carry around a lot of musical equipment. And I, you know, I'd heard that he was, I'd heard that he was, he, you know, that he was a Christian and that he was a singer and he, he used to go and, um, he would go to different places and, and, and sing. And so he had all this equipment that he would carry with him. So that's why he had this big van. Well, with him being a music lover, he had this great stereo in his van. I mean, it was, he had this Kenwood stereo, man, with, with both speakers. And I love music, you know. And uh, so everybody piled into Mr. Johnson's van. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to conversate because I didn't want anything to slip out about my plans for the next night. And so I, in order to keep from having to talk to anybody, I went and sat in the back of the van where you open up the back doors and, and put stuff in. Wasn't even a seat back there. I said, I'll just lay back here and I'll ride back here and, and listen to music. So I, I kind of curled up next to one of the Bose speakers, man, and was just enjoying the music. And, you know, this song came on, and, he had, and you know, he was playing this, this cassette, because, you know, that's how old we were. Uh, he was playing this cassette, and this song came on, and the bass line sounded like Earth, Wind, and Fire. I thought it was the uh, way of the world. And I was listening to this bass line, and I was waiting for Earth, Wind, and Fire to start singing. And then all of a sudden, this guy starts singing, and it wasn't Earth, Wind, and Fire. And he starts singing, we are all his children. We are God's creation. His love reaches out to all. I'm like, what? And then the dude said, never is he willing that even one life should perish. His love reaches out to all. And man, my jaw dropped. And I'm like, whoa. Was he talking to me? You know, it was like he, he was like he was talking directly to me. And I listened to that song. And then I started listening to other songs. And when the song came on, uh, I said, you know, I said to Mr. Johnson, I yelled up above everybody that was talking in the van. I'm like, hey, Mr. Johnson, who's that you got playing in your stereo? And he said, oh, it's this guy named Bruce Hibbert. Um, I said, I never heard him before. He said, oh, yeah, he's, he's not real well known, he said, but, you know, yes, he, he has a lot of good music. And uh, I said, oh, okay. So I listened to it, man, and I kept listening. I listened to it all the way to the dinner theater. And then he had the tape still in the stereo when we got done, and I listened to it all the way back home. And so the next day, the next morning, <laughs> I waited till about 10, 10 30 in the morning. And I rode, I you know, I wouldn't even, you know, my parents weren't home, so I didn't even have access to a car. So I was riding my 10 speed. I rode my 10 speed over to Christian Book and Gift in Olathe. And I was hoping that nobody would see me going into a Christian bookstore, you know, like looking around, like, okay, the coast is clear. And man, I went in there and I bought Bruce Hibbert's album and I took it home. And it was vinyl, you know, so back then you couldn't look up lyrics on, on the internet. You had to hope that they had them written down on the sleeve, on the album sleeve, you know, and his was on the sleeve. Man, I went down in my basement at about noon and I put his his record on the stereo and I let it play and I just read along and I read the lyrics as the song began, as the songs began to play. And next thing I know, man, tears just rolling down my eyes. 
And I didn't know why, you know? I mean, it was good music, but I didn't know why I was crying. Like, what, what is this all about? And not realizing that the whole time that, you know, I was reading this and he was singing, I'm reading what is actually scriptures that he had put music to. And every time it would come to the end of one side, I'd flip it over and let the other side play. And then when it would come to the end, I'd flip it over and I'd let it play again. I kept playing that record, that, that whole album, I kept playing it over and over and over. I was downstairs, I never went upstairs. I never went up for food. There was a bathroom down there, so I never left to go to the bathroom. And uh, I just kept playing that record over and over again, man. Next thing I know, I kind of glance you know, at the window and notice that there's no light coming through the window anymore. And I look up at the clock and it was past midnight on that Saturday. I had been there for over 12 hours listening to this record. And I didn't want to kill myself anymore after listening to this guy's music, you know? And that's, that's really what put me on the path to, you know, after that, that's when I started really seeking out a real relationship with God. And uh, subsequently, you know, my grandmother got sick. And, and when she got sick in Louisiana, uh, they thought that she was going to die. And my mother flew down there right away because, you know, they said, you got to get here. She's probably not going to make it through the night. So my mother flew down there right away. And my grandmother was hemorrhaging from everywhere. You know, she'd been an alcoholic for all my life, all her life almost. And uh, she was hemorrhaging from everywhere, man. Her liver was completely eaten away. He was gone. And uh, she managed to live through that night. I had missed a bunch of school during the school year earlier in the year because I had had chicken pox. So I missed a bunch of days. And so I couldn't really afford to miss a lot of school. But my mom was like, she, you know, she told my, my stepdad, just bring him down so he can say goodbye to her. And then we're going to, we got to get him back so he doesn't miss much class. And then we'll, we'll fly him back down for the funeral. So they, they had the funeral planned, everything, you know, the casting picked out, everything was done. They got me down there and I go in. Uh, I remember going in to, to say goodbye to my grandmother. And, I mean, there were big, there were big bottles of, of blood with tubes going into it where she had bled. You know, she was hemorrhaging. And they had these bottles next to the bed and they had all these tubes hooked up to her. And she had been in a coma. She hadn't spoke in like a week. And uh, they were just waiting for her to die. Just she could die at any moment. And I sat there next to her bed for a long time. And then finally, when it was time for me to leave, you know, they said, okay, we got to get, we got to get him back home so that he doesn't miss too much school. Uh, <clears throat> They took me by her house so I could pick up my clothes and and we were gonna stop by the hospital to say one last goodbye on our way back to Kansas City on our way out of town. And while I was gathering up my clothes in her room, <clears throat> I remember kneeling at her bed at, her, at the house. Everybody was at the hospital. So it was just me and my dad at the house. <clears throat> And I remember kneeling by her bed and my dad was in the car waiting for me. And I knelt and I said, God, if you're really real, can you please heal my grandmother? And if you heal my grandmother, I will serve you for the rest of my life. 
And I meant that, you know, and I got up, got in the car, and we drove to the hospital to say one last goodbye to my grandmother. And when I got in the room, I grabbed her by her hand, all the tubes and stuff still hooked up to her. You know, everybody is sitting out in, in the waiting area. My mother was in the room. Uh, my, my aunt was in the room. Her, her sister was, my, my grandmother's sister was in the room. A couple, a couple of nurses. And I grabbed my grandmother by the hand and I said, I've got to leave and get back to school. I said, but I'm coming back to visit you. So don't you die on me. You hear me? Don't you die on me. She squoze my hand. She opened her eyes for the first time in a week. And she looked me in my eye. And when she opened up her mouth, her tongue was completely black. And there was cracks in it from all the, the stuff that she'd been going through. And she looked at me and she opened up her mouth and she said, I said, don't you die on me. She said, I won't. That's all she said. Man, people started screaming. My, they ran down the hall. She's, she's woke, she's woke, she's talking, she's woke. I mean, you know, it was, everybody just started going crazy. And I walked out of that hospital and went home. And a couple of days later, my grandmother walked out of the hospital and went back to her house. And she lived another, gosh, five, six years after that. They said she was a walking miracle. Wow. But, you know, it all, it all started that, that day you know, in Mr. Johnson's van, listening to that song. And everything just kind of, you know, all got put together from there. And it, it and when I saw how powerful God was and, and how powerful that whole moment was and saw that he was faithful to do what I asked him to do and to keep his part of the promise, I felt like, well, I got to keep mine, you know? And so that's when I really started that's when I really went and, and surrendered my life and just changed my life. Wow. I started trying my best to be a Christian, you know. So that was it. I'm blown away. I'm blown away. Um, one other thing I want to hit on is you actually met the musician uh, that wrote that song, that wrote, wrote that album, right? Yeah, man. You got to tell, uh, tell that story. Wow. Uh, I, uh, I was about, let me see, in 1997, uh, we moved to Nashville, Tennessee, from Kansas City. And we had started going to this church, uh, and the pastor and his wife invited my wife and I over to their house for dinner. And we went to their house for dinner and we were all sitting around, we were sitting around in their kitchen and you know they hadn't quite finished cooking dinner yet. And we were sitting around talking and we were all having this conversation about what drew us to Christ, what drew us to Christianity. And I told them the story that I just told you about how I was planning to kill myself. And God used the music of this one unknown artist. I mean, you, you didn't hear his music on the radio. Nobody knew who this guy was. And God used his music to literally save my life. I mean, that guy's music is the reason why I'm still breathing today. Because if I hadn't heard that one song that caught my attention long enough for me to go and get his album, which caught my attention long enough for me to really seek God in a really desperate situation, 
it all started with that one song. And if I hadn't heard that one song, I wouldn't be here today. And so I told them that. And I told them the story, you know, and um, pastor looked at me and he said, you know what? He says, hey, uh, before we have, before we eat, I got to make one run to the store real quick. He says, you want to come with me? He looked at me and I was like, okay. And so, you know, my wife and, and his wife, you know, they, they stayed there and they kept talking. I got in the car with him and, you know, I'm thinking we're going to the grocery store and he pulls into the parking lot of this place uh, behind the mall it, next to uh, Galleria Mall in, in Franklin, Tennessee. And it was a rock climbing place. And I thought, hmm, why is he stopping here? And uh, he gets out and he says, hey, come in here with me for a second. I'm like, all right. So I got out of the car and walked in with him. And when he walked in, this guy, the guy behind the counter says, hey, Pastor Danny, how you doing? And my pastor at the time was Danny Chambers. And he uh, says, hey, Pastor Danny, how you doing, man? It's so good to see you. And uh, he says, man, it's good to see you too. And he says, hey, I want to introduce you to, my, to uh, one of the newest members at my church. This is Sanford Robinson. So he looked at me, he said, Sanford, I want to introduce you to my friend, Bruce Hibbert. And it was the guy who sang the song, the one song that saved my life. I was blown away. You know, this, I finally got to meet this guy after all these years, you know, that had happened when I was in high school, you know, in 19... That had happened in 1982, in my senior year of high school. And here it was, 1997, you know, all those years later. And I told the guy the story of what happened and how his music saved my life. And the guy just broke down and cried, man. And I cried, and my pastor was crying. It was, you know, it was just... It was a really powerful moment, you know, and it, it was just amazing how God just connected all the dots, man, and just brought me full circle back, you know, into this guy's life to let him know how much his music had impacted me and how it literally saved my life. And the guy had stopped making music. You know, he told me, he said, you know, uh, my music didn't really go over well, you know, for radio. And he said, I couldn't get any airplay on the radio. My, I wasn't really selling a lot of records. Uh, my popularity wasn't really high in the United States. He says, I had a lot of popularity in Asia. He says, but here in the States, I, you know, I wasn't really doing that well. And he said, so I finally just gave up. And... I opened up this store here and, you know, he, he had opened up a, a rock climbing business. And, you know, after he and I talked and, and I told him about what happened, I found out later that he went on to, to make some more music, you know, and, and, and for me, it just lets me know that regardless of what you're doing, if you're doing, if you're doing what God called you to do, it may not seem like you're making an impact and it may not seem like what you're doing is that important, but for any singer songwriter that, you know, hasn't made it big and is you know, getting platinum records and, and, and making millions and millions of dollars to be able to know that if you could just put out one song, if you could just write one song that could save somebody's life, look at how much of an impact that would have on the world. Just one song, you know? So regardless of, of how you feel like you may, you may feel like you failed or you may feel like you're not a success. If you just got one song, just give me that one song. Cause that one song could reach 
another kid that was like me in that same situation. Just give me one, you know, and start from there. So yeah, I love that. And I'm just thinking, you know, it's just whatever profession or background, it could be one conversation. Yeah, that you have with another human being that sets them on the course, uh, yeah, to a, to a to a better life and puts them in a in a better in a better way, you know, one more yeah. truly, uh, one more, yeah, one more, and uh, I'm so I'm I'm so uh, just grateful for you taking this time to speak to everyone, and and I learn something all the time, you know, mm-hmm. when we when we speak, you know, I. There's just so many things in the backstory of, of other human beings, and so I'm just honored to be your friend, and uh, you. and it's just a, a blessing. And I know that there's um, uh, I I know. There's people that need this message right now. Yeah. Right now. So it's timely. Uh, and it's important. And, you know, there was no, we didn't have a script. There's no agenda no, no. for this. This is what came no. out. So, yeah, it's uh, God's hands on it. And, and, that's, and that's enough. <laughs>